that's crazy. Look at that. Sort of. It's yeah. It, this is screen. Welcome to screencasting inception. Um, we're about to code single user Twitter. Okay, so I see the microphone thing going. I'm, I'm, I think I can be happy to close this down and let it run. All right, so we'll start by creating a new GitHub repository. I have one from the other section, but I'll create a separate one just so that we can see that whole process again. So I'll call it uh, single user Twitter 2. Um, this is a simple non-scaffolded Rails app that implements um, single user status updates, period. Okay, so this is my repo. I don't want any code to be in it to start with, so I'm not going to initialize it with anything. I'm simply going to say create repository. That gives me my blank repository. I'm going to go to my folder where I've been keeping all of my Rails projects. Here it is. It's called Rails Projects. And I'll left shift, right click, open window here. And now I can ask it to, uh, to make me a new Rails project. I have a previous one called Single Twitter. So I'll just call this one Twitter, I guess. Uh, so I'll say Rails new to start a new Rails project and Twitter, enter. So that does what Rails new always does, which is create uh, the folder structure for a sort of new Rails application. And we'll see it in my Rails project folder. There'll now be a Twitter folder there. It's running one to install to make sure that all my gems are synchronized. And once it finishes, I can run these commands. So these are the commands that we're going to use to associate our local repository with the GitHub version of the repository. In the example that they give you here, they're assuming that you have a single file. You're going to touch a readme markdown file and then commit that. We're starting with an entire sort of Rails um, default project. So we're not going to run that line. And when it comes time to adding files, we're going to just add dot to sort of recursively add all the files in our folder. So let's do this. Let's go to my Twitter folder and we can sort of follow along with the instructions that they provided. So first we want to initialize this folder as a git repository that will create our hidden dot git folder. Then we're going to add all of the files that exist in the project to the staging area. And then we're going to commit uh, initial commit of a default Rails app, soon to be Twitter. And so that commits to my local Git repository. I have to now link it to my GitHub repository. And I do that by copying and pasting this line here where we add a remote and call that remote origin. And once I've added the remote, I can now push to it. So I can say git push minus u where I want to push to, which is origin, and master is the name of my local repository. And because I did minus u, from now on, I'll only ever have to do git push, and it will remember the origin and the master. So back over at GitHub, if I reload the repo, it's got my files in it. So we know things are working. There's one commit. And we can see there's my initial commit message. All right, so we're going to plan out our application. Uh, we want a system where we can display uh, status messages that are saved in a database and we want a way of adding new status messages to that database by way of a form and so uh, we're going to have a database table that we're going to call tweets and we're not actually going to provide that name what we're going to do is we're going to create a model a description of a model uh, that we're going to call tweet 
And this description, it, although we won't specify it, an ID will come into existence for this model. And this will be a primary key in the database. We will specify that there will be a column called status, and it will have a type of string. And we'll also sort of get for free uh, created at and updated at columns or properties on this model. So the only one we have to specify is status string. The rest of them are just created, and they'll end up inside of our, our tweets table. So maybe this is better defined here. In the database, the string will actually be a varchar of length 255. And so when we specify the model, all we're actually specifying is just status string. So the model singular, it's capitalized. We don't necessarily have to capitalize it at the command prompt. It'll just become a capitalized entity because it's an object. And then the pluralized version of the model is the name of the database table that's created. We're also going to have a controller. It's going to be named after our database table, so it's going to be called tweets. And that controller will have an index action, and it will have a create action, two different actions. The index action will have an associated view, which will be uh, in the app views uh, tweets folder called index.html.erb. And the create action will have no view associated with it. And that's because it's just going to carry out the create task, and it will then redirect back to the index. So on success, redirect to index. I guess the only th other thing I need to mention is that there'll be a validation on this column here. Uh, validates the length to be 1 to 140 characters. So that'll be something we add to the model once the model is actually generated. Uh, beyond that, we'll have some routes set up. We'll have a root route, so like slash. And it's going to route to the tweets controller's index action uh, when it's a get request. And we're also going to have a create route which will be responding to a post, also to slash. So I'm just going to use the same URL for both of our routes. So the URL in both cases is slash, but the verb is a little different. And then this one will run the tweets controllers create action. And I think that's all the planning we need to do up front. How does that sit with everybody? That's sort of our, our goal for what we want to build. We're going to start with the model. Uh, once we have a model, we'll go into the Rails console and we'll add tweets from the console so that we have some tweets in our database. And that way we can implement the index action first, listing all the tweets, and then work our way towards the create action, which is a little bit more complicated. So we'll start with creating the model. So from my command prompt, I'm in my Twitter folder. Uh, I can create my model now. I'm not going to create any of this with scaffolding, so I'm going to go directly to say Rails G for generate model. And the name of my model is tweet. The capitalization there isn't necessary. I just do it for sort of convention purposes. And a tweet is going to have a status column, which is a string. And truthfully, uh, the default data type is string. So I could leave that off. But again, for the sort of the sake of being explicit, I'll, I'll put it on there. So if we had more columns, we would add them now, delimited by spaces. So it would be another space and then another key value pair with a colon in the middle of it. But we only need this one uh, column beyond the ones that are going to be sort of automatically generated for us. So Rails generate model tweet, status string, that looks good. I can press Enter. And so this will create a number of files and folders. The most two important files it creates, well, there will be a tweet.rb in the app models folder. And there will be a migration in the database 
migration folder for creating our tweets database. And so here you can see this is the migration, which will be the description of what the tweets database is going to look like based off of my description of the command line, and then the model as well. So we can open both of those up inside of Komodo. So app models tweet. It's a very simple class which inherits from Active Record Base, so it's going to have all the capabilities of Active Record. It's immediately associated by way of naming conventions with um, the tweets database. So this is associated with the tweets table in the database. And we've specified adder accessible, meaning that from the outside world, we're allowing uh, status to be sort of uh, read and writable. So from our web form, eventually we'll be able to add new statuses to tweets. And we can open up the migration just to look at it. Often you can just trust that the migration built like it was supposed to. But in this case, we'll look and see that we have a description here of a table being created called tweets, which will have a string called status in it, uh, the timestamps. And what's not shown is that there will also be an ID created. And so the next step is I need to actually run that migration. I want the migration to run and create the table, and I do that using rake. So I type rake db migrate. And rake db migrate will look in my migration folder, and it will look at all new migrations. So there's one in there right now. If we had been sort of working on a project for a while and we ran rake db migrate, it knows Rake knows sort of the, the most recently run migration, and it'll only run the new ones compared to that. So we'll run that. We'll then have a tweets table. After that's run, we can also look. There's a schema.rb file that's in the DB folder. If you ever need to sort of know what your database looks like, where, what all the tables are in your database, what all the columns are within those tables, the schema is where you go. You never edit this file. It's auto-generated by migration. So you don't go mess around with this file. But here's where Rails is keeping track of the most recent migration that was run. If we compared this number with the number that's on the front of the migration we just ran, we'd see they're the same. It's just a timestamp. And it shows us the current state of our database. So the current state of our database is that we have a tweets table with the following properties. And again, not displayed here is the fact that there's a primary key called ID. So now that I have my model and I have my table, it's probably time to do a quick uh, check in to GitHub. So I can git add, like maybe just do git status to see what's outstanding. You can see that it's picked up that these are new files or changes to files. Git add dot will recursively add any modified or added files. Git commit, I can explain that I have added a tweet model. And uh, like that. And I can push it. So now I said uh, the next step is going to be to add a few tweets by way of the console. So I can go Rails C for console. Notice I'm not running my server even yet. I'm not yet concerned with Rails as a web app. I'm just sort of working on the back end. After this, we'll get the server up and running, and then we can start focusing on the, the web version of our app. So here's my Rails console, which is just sort of like IRB, our interactive Ruby prompt, but it's aware of our models. So I could look at what it is to be a tweet. I could say tweet.new. And I could see that a tweet in object space has an ID, a status, created at, and updated at. I can actually go and try to create a new tweet. Tweet.create, and I only need to specify the status. I never need to specify the ID that's generated for me automatically as an auto incrementing primary key. And I never need to specify manually the created at or updated at. Active Record handles those for me as well. So tweet create, specifying a status, 
and my status was uh, command line Twitter is boring. And so that should create one row in my tweets table. So running tweet.count should tell me one, which it does, which is just a select count star uh, SQL request. And I could create another tweet. Now I could create one in a two-step process. So I could create one with new and saving it to like say a tweet variable. And now command line Twitter is no longer boring, apparently. And so now I have a tweet variable, but it hasn't been saved to my database yet. So if I did tweet.count, we'd still see one because my new tweet called tweet is simply in object space. And we know that because when I type in tweet, it tells me that it has no primary key. There's no ID yet been assigned. I can have it be saved to the database, tweet.save. Tweet.count now tells me two. Uh, tweet.all shows me those two. Anything that the controller can do uh, in interacting with the model, we can do from the command prompt here. Now, I also said earlier that I wanted a validation on my tweet such that the status was restricted to uh, a minimum and a maximum size. So I might say something like this in the model. I might say validates the status. It's a length validation where the length is going to have a maximum value of 140 characters and a minimum minimum value of one. And notice I'm using sort of the old style um, hash specification. In the new style hash specification, if you're looking around on the net, it would look more like this. So I'll do one below the other. And then this would move over here like that. And this would move over here like that. So this is the old style where you're specifying the symbols with the colon on the left and you're still using the hash rocket and this is the new style. So if you're looking around for code, uh, Rails code online, you're more likely to see it in the new style. They're identical. I'm holding on to the old style because I'm a throwback kind of guy. So, uh, and I like the hash rocket symbol. And so I'll, I'll leave off this one here, but I just wanted to show you what it would look like if you were to write it in that other style. So there's our model with a single validation in it. If I was to go to my console now, it wouldn't be aware of this validation yet. I have to make it reload my models. Uh, so when you load up your Rails console, it goes to the models folder, loads them all up, but it loads them all up once and it just sort of like caches them at that point. So if I want to have it reload all my models, I tell it to reload. And because reload is a dangerous method, there's an exclamation mark at the end of it. It has like a dangerous effect on state. And that reloads my models. So now if I was to create another tweet variable, tweet.new, and I tried to save it, tweet.save, save will return a boolean to me, true or false. If the data actually was persisted, then save would return true. If the data doesn't get persisted, save returns false. In this case, save should return false because my validation is going to fail. And you can see that that's the case. I've got false being returned. If I provide tweet with a status, today I ate some soup and uh, press enter. Now my tweet has status. And if I save it, now true was returned. And tweet.count, we now see that there's three tweets in my tweets table. Tweet.all would show us all three. 
So the console ends up being invaluable for sort of working with your database, either seeding it with data like this, modifying with it, sometimes just troubleshooting. If you have a controller action that's not working the way you think it should work, you can go and replicate what the controller action is actually doing uh, in the console and you can see where it's failing. For now though, I'm done with what I need for the console, so I'll exit. And if I type git status, I'll see that I have you know, my validation, I might as well pack that away. Added a validation or length of read status. So I do lots of little commits along through my project because I'm about to start working on something that's not directly model related, so I might as well get that validation uh, stored away in the repo so I can work on something else. So if we go look back at our plan, uh, we've got our table, we've got our model with its validations, it's time to start working on the controller and the routes. So I can use this now to do a Rails server, so my command prompt here will now be the server, and I'll need a new Rails prompt, so I'll go Open a new one, left shift, right click, open command window here. I now have a server running on port 3000 and I can go to localhost 3000 and I should see the sort of welcome message for Rails. And I can also see things about my Rails application. So if I click on this top link, I can see the version of Ruby that I'm using, the version of Rails that I'm using, other bits of information as well. I don't want this to be my, my root thing for my application. Um, I want, as I said earlier, when I go to the root to have the index action be displayed. So I actually have to go remove this because this is a static file inside of the public folder it's this index HTML. So the way Rails loads up resources is it first looks to the public folder and looks to see if there is an HTML page with the name of the path that you've provided with it. And if there is not, then it goes off and does proper routing. So I'm just gonna remove this index.html file. I'll remove it from the command prompt so that um, Git is aware of it being removed. So I'll say git remove public index.html and you can see now it's gone from the folder. If I was to rerun or reload I'll now get a routing error because there's nothing set to route to the root at the moment. So I want to build my controller and I know my controller needs two actions index and create so I can specify it from the command prompt uh, to create the new controller, but to create it with those actions. So I can say Rails generate controller. The controller's name is tweets, and it's going to have an index action and a create action. If I just did Rails generate controller tweets, that would have been fine, uh, but Rails will do a little bit of extra work for me by, and since I know what my actions are, I might as well specify them up front. After I do this, I'll do another push to GitHub, but I'll make a few little tweaks before uh, I actually do that push. So I've got a new tweets controller. Uh, the generators tried to be helpful to me and it's added some uh, routes to my routing file. I'm gonna go remove those before we save this change. And because I specified that I wanted an index and create action, it created those views for me. But remember, we don't have a view associated with create. And so we're gonna go, delete that view. So I'll go to my app views twitters or tweets folder and I will delete the create and I will go to my routing file and I'll remove the routes that were generated. So that's in the config folder routes. 
these were the two generated routes we're going to route for ourselves. So I'll remove those. Now I can do a push to GitHub. Git status will show me what has changed. Git add will show me that I've gone and staged all those files, including the deleted file. It's been staged as well. And then I can say git commit minus m added a tweets controller with an index and create action. And I can push it to GitHub. So I'll open a few more files in my editor. I'll open up the controller that was generated. It's in the app controllers folder called tweets. You can see it inherits from application controller. Application controller is actually in this folder. Application controller in turn inherits from action controller base. So similar to how active record works, but there's now this sort of middle uh, object that sits in the inheritance chain. And it's there because sometimes you might want to add something that all controllers can do. And so if you add it to the application controller, it will be inherited by all of your controllers. And then they will all also inherit from act, uh, action controller base. So it's this little middle place. And we'll use it later on in the course for things like authentication. So if we look in the tweets controller, uh, there are the two actions that we have to find. Index and create. So that's good. And we can go open up the view <coughs> in the app tweets folder, index view. So right now this index view is just sort of the, the placeholder text. Uh, but even with that in place, we have a controller with an action. We have an associated view, which will sort of load up so automatically load the app views tweets index.html.erb. So we're ready for a route. We can create a route already now. And the route can route to the index and it will, or it should at least, display the default view, this one here. So in the routing file, I'm going to use the root command to set up a root route. So I'll say root should point to the tweets controllers index action and I'm going to limit this route such that it only responds to get requests because that's how I had envisioned it here I said I wanted a root route that responded to get to slash and that it would load up the index action so that's what I've specified here And without even needing to restart my server, my server is dynamic. It'll pick up changes to routes and whatnot. So I should be able to go back to my web browser, reload the root path. And there is the sort of default view. So the routing has worked. The action itself doesn't have any code in it, but it's, it is automatically loading up the proper view. And so I can change this up here. I can change this h1 to say something like uh, single user Twitter. And then I can imagine, and I will make this uh, so in a moment, but I can imagine that in this code I'm going to want to loop through all the tweets that are in my database. And so I'm going to need some kind of loop I'll need a variable called tweets, which I can run each on. And then I will call each tweet tweet singular. And then the block associated with that will be executed once for every tweet in this tweets collection. 
And so for each tweet, I just want to display the status of the tweet. So maybe inside, maybe I do all of this inside of a div with an ID of tweets. So maybe if I want to do some styling later on, I have this div available to me. And then inside of here, I have, say, like inside of a paragraph tag with a class of tweet singular. And I'm just setting up my IDs and classes for future styling purposes. Then I'm going to echo out the tweet status. So remember that we open our sort of ERB blocks, our embedded Ruby blocks, with less than percent and percent greater than. We include an equal sign if we want them to echo. So we want the status to be echoed within our paragraph tag, so we include this equal sign. But for the loop itself, we don't want that to echo anything out because that would effectively echo out uh, what's returned by tweets. So we don't want that to happen. So no equal sign here, but an equal sign within here. Now, if I was to run this right now, I would get a nil error. It can be helpful to see what that looks like sometimes. I'll get a, a, an error which will say that it's tried to call each on a nil object. undefined method each for nil, nil class. Okay, that makes sense because I haven't actually created this variable. That said, that's a very common error. So you'll often be coding a Rails application and you get an error saying something's nil. Well, you haven't provided something in your view from your controller that's required. In this case, it's this variable here. So from my controller, I can make that variable available. I can say the tweets variable should be all tweets from my model. So the controller talks to the model, it creates instance variables, those instance variables are uh, accessible inside of the associated view and so by saying that the tweet model should load all tweets and save that into a tweets variable, my error will now go away. So if I run my code again, There's my three tweets that I built by way of the command line. They should probably be in the opposite order. I probably would just like to have the most recent tweet up at the top. And so I could cheat, and this would be bad form. I could go in here and do like a reverse call on the collection. and it does what I want. But I'm, I'm trying to keep as much Ruby code out of my views, and I'm trying to also get the database to do the database's work. And so the database can order things for me. So when I create this tweet, or when I gather all the tweets, I'll say, please specify my tweets in order of ID descending. And that will do the same thing as if I had run reverse on the collection. So always get the database to do the work if it can. Ruby is, of course, slower than, than the database at working with large collections of data. For three tweets, it's not a big deal. For you know 30,000 tweets, it might be. How are we standing so far? Is there any questions at this point? I basically made my controller. I'm working with a single view. And I'm making sure the data that I need in that view is made available by way of talking to the model from the action. We're good? We're good. OK. So I could now go back to, say, my console, and I could start adding more tweets, and they would appear inside of here. But what I really want is a form to exist inside of my index action where I can type in, in the web form, a tweet press submit and have it actually add to my list. So that's a two-step process. Step one, I need to create the form itself inside of the index action. And then step two is I'm going to have to have that form submit to the create action. And the create action will actually go to the model and build that tweet and save it. So we'll build the form first. So I want the form to appear above my tweets. and I'm going to use a echoing ERB block to build this form. 
there's going to be an end associated with it because it's going to have a block that is associated with it. And I'm going to use the helper called form4. And what I'm building this form for is a tweet. And I'm going to call a block, so I'll have a do and an end. And we have a block parameter called f. I could have called this block parameter something else. It ends up being a form builder, so a thing that will help me build the elements that are, that are required for my form. And f is just nice and short. So we'll, we'll just leave it at f. Now again, if I ran this code, I would get an error because tweet doesn't exist. And so if I save this and gives me a nil class error, line three, which is the line where my form four is being called, because there's no at tweet variable, so I need to make that accessible. It just needs to be an empty tweet object. And so from the index controller, I can say at tweet equals tweet dot new. So just create a new tweet in object space, an empty one, uh, solely for the form to be able to work with it. Having done that, I get another error. This error now has to do with the fact that the, the form itself wants to post to something, right? When I, when I have a form, the goal of a form is eventually to be submitted and posted to something. And now Rails is giving us a bit of a clue as to where it wants to submit the form data. It's trying to reference something called a tweets path. And so that indicates to me, because I know that we prefix named routes or we postfix names routes with underscore path to route to them. And so I need a route called tweets to exist in order for this form to be able to submit to it. And so I'm going to use that word tweets with my routing file. And I'm going to say match. And here, just like I specified before, I still want the URL that responds to this route to be slash. So I'm going to match slash, have it run the, uh, I'm going back and forth between single and double. Can't have that. Neither one makes a difference. I just want to be consistent. Uh, tweets create. And here I'm going to give it the name that Rails is looking for that tweets path. So I'm going to say as uh, tweets. And I only want this route to trigger via a post. So when Rails sees an HTTP post to the root of our application, it's going to route that to the create actions of the tweets controller. And internally, this route shall be known as tweets. So now we have a tweets path that our form can make use of. The form doesn't yet exist because I haven't given it any internals. But if I view source, we can see it here. And we can see that the action where it's going to actually post this data is the correct one, the root and that the method is also the correct one, post. So this was the match that we set up. And those are the only two routes that we need for our application, right? We needed one for the root and one for the create. So we're now done with routing. All we need to do now is fill out the form so that we actually have a text area in the form and a submit button in the form. And then we have to fill out the create action to do the appropriate um, active record work to create our tweet. So we'll start with the form. We build the elements of our form with this F variable. And so if I want a text field, I can say echo out F dot text field. And this is for the property of the tweet object that we have called status. 
and also echo out uh, submit button. And I could add uh, extra arguments to submit to specify what I wanted on my button text, but there's a nice default that we'll see in a moment, so we'll just leave it with the default. So this should give me a form that will post to the root uh, tweets path, and it'll contain a text field uh, to specify our tweet status, and it'll contain a submit button to actually submit the status. And there it is. If I was to click on it, uh, there would be an error. What would happen is I would submit the form contents to the create path, and then the create action would run. And because we haven't told it otherwise, it'll try to load up a app views tweets create.index.html. And so that would be an error. We can try it out. This should error. And I'll get a template error. saying that there's you know a template missing for tweets create. We know we don't want that tweets create, we're going to redirect so we can go and start performing that uh, that work here. So we have the form built. We want to create a new tweet. Let's say tweet tweet.new and Whenever we submit a form, the data from that form ends up in this thing called the param sash. And we have to know where to look within this param sash. And if you ever forget, there's there's conventions. I mean, I, I know because we're building a tweet that I'm going to look at position tweet. But if I didn't know that and I wanted to sort of reverse engineer where to sort of index into in the param sash, I can go to my index. I can view source and I can look at any of the inputs that actually are going to cause data to be submitted. So this is the input for the tweet status and you can see the name of it is status in square braces prefixed by tweet. This is the position of the params hash where we need to look. So if you ever get confused as to where to look in the params hash you can look at the form itself and the properties will always exist inside of square braces, and then where they'll end up in the params hash comes before that. So at this point, if I was to submit the form, the data from the form would come out here. I could be even more explicit, but I don't need to be. But I could be even more explicit by specifying that I had uh, a new tweet with a status of params and then I could even sort of index down to that status. This is sort of overblown because here I'm providing a hash with a key of status where I already have a hash with a key of status. right? So I wouldn't actually do this but I, just to show you that I could dig down to get that status I can do it in this long form. But really all I need to do is that. Now I want to see if my validations pass, so I can say if tweet.save. And so uh, there's just going to be some placeholder text here or code. I will eventually fill this out, what to do when the save does not work. But when it does work, when we've actually correctly saved a tweet, all we need to do is redirect the user's browser to the action called index. So this is where validation would happen. If our tweet validates, then re redirect. That's us overriding the function of having the action automatically load up an associated view. If the tweet didn't save, if there was a failure for saving, well, there's nothing here, and so we get to the end of the create action, and then there would be another template error because it would try to load up the create.html.erb. But in this case, we've overridden that functionality. It'll just redirect, and we'll be fine. And so at this point, I can try this out. I should now be able to create new tweets from the web. This tweet should end up in the database table.
and there it is. Redirected me back to the index. The tweet is showing, it's showing at the top because of my order statement, and I can create any number of tweets I want now from the command line, or sorry, from the, the web. However, if I was to create an invalid tweet, say one of zero length, my validations will fail. And I get that template missing. So I need to do something to handle that case. And the something I need to do will happen right here. And so I'm going to render the view associated with the index action. And so I could say render the view associated with the index action. That'll then use this view. I'll have this view requires a tweet variable and I have one now so that should be fine but there will be an error that occurs and we can go see it in action so I'll first trigger that error and then we will fix it so here I'm saying render out this action again I get another nil class error this happens you know often in Rails you know anytime we have an instance variable that doesn't exist it'll trigger this and it's telling me it's happening on line 9, whereas where I reference a tweets variable in my view. Remember, these two actions state-wise are completely separate, right? So in the index action, I have access to a tweets variable and a tweet variable. Here in the create action, I need to make a tweets variable accessible if I'm going to render the same view as the index action. I don't need it in all cases, so I'll just do it right here. I'll say tweets equals tweet.order, where the ID is just sending. Seasoned Rails programmers would now yell dry at me because I'm repeating myself, right? And it might not seem like that big of a deal uh, that I've got this here and this here repeated, but really any time you repeat yourself, you're causing potential maintenance issues later on. So someone or myself decides that the order of the tweets needs to change. And now to change the order of the tweets in my application, I need to change it in two places. So I'll leave this repetition in the code just for the sake of simplicity. But know that this is something that, as a Rails programmer, would bother me. And I would want to refactor it out. And we'll, in later classes, we'll learn how to refactor this kind of repetition out of our controllers. So again, I can go back here, and I can create an empty tweet, and it brings me back here. The only weird thing that you may have noticed is that the tweet button sort of got pushed over, and that's because within my form, Rails has now wrapped, if I wanted for styling purposes, to sort of do something with the form that um, had caused the validation error. My input is now wrapped with a div that has a class of field with errors. So I could say highlight that, uh, that field in red, you know, if something went wrong. And divs are automatically sort of breaking elements. So uh, by wrapping that in a div, it's causing my, uh, my input button to jump down a line. We'll have a little bit of time because I'm, I'm basically done. So we can try to apply a little bit of styling and maybe fix that problem in a moment. As it stands, we're, we're sort of done what we needed to do here. If we look back at our initial plan, uh, we have our database table. We have our model with validations. We have our controller and the two actions implemented. We have the routes that are associated with those two actions. So our code is done. At the end of the create action, uh, no associated view is loaded. We either redirect or render. So we've overloaded or sort of overwritten that default behavior by either a redirect or a render. Any questions on the code up to this point? So it's been a while since I uh, saved to GitHub, so I'll do that. Uh, 
implemented the index and create action for the tweets controller and push that. So you can see even for like a fairly small uh, application, I'm already at five commits. And so that's the kind of sort of small level commit access that you should be striving for when working with Git because anything larger, your ability to roll back or manage change becomes a little bit more difficult. Does anyone need to see any of these uh, files before I do any more work here? Okay, so there's a couple more things I could do. Uh, one of them, maybe I'd like to uh, have a little bit of styling around the errors. So maybe I'd like to, if there is an error on validation, I would like the uh, the input to have like a, a red line around it or something like that. I could apply some kind of CSS here, styling, uh, because when there is an error, I get this extra div of class field with errors. So I can apply some styling to that. And so to apply styling, I can go into my app assets style sheets folder and we have a tweets SAS file that I can work with. And so remember, SAS is uh, compiled to CSS. If you write just plain old CSS in here, it works as well though. Uh, and the field that I'm trying to style is a div of class field with errors and it's inside of a form. So I could do something, I'll just do a regular old CSS. field with errors and I could uh, very basic CSS right provide a border um, like that if I go back to my code if I reload this, I shouldn't see a border because there's no error as of yet. There it is. That's not red. Solid red. <laughs> so I could do that. That doesn't look all that great. I could also target the input within it. That at least gives me a bit more, but it sort of wrecks the, the look of the input. So I'd probably have to play around a little bit more. I'm not going to do that at this point. I could also uh, change my display to inline just so I don't have that uh, button dropping down. So if I'm sort of a regular old input, I make an error. Didn't want to fix it for me, did you? Oh, no. I've, well, here I can show you the, um, the interesting elements of working with SAS. So I could have my div field have a uh, display inline on it and then within that I can nest my input. So SAS allows for this kind of nesting so that I've nested my input within this target of CSS so this bit of CSS is associated only with this div that has that particular class and then the second bit of CSS is associated with any input that happens to be within a div of that class. And I'll go back to my code here. And there we go. So here's a regular view without any extra styling. If I have an error, it turns into red. Uh, I might even want to display an error message. 
And so I might want to um, have an error message displayed to the user. And so something like if they, you know, if they incorrectly submitted their tweet, if it was too long or too short, I might want to have a paragraph with a class of error display and saying, you know, all tweets must be one to 140 characters in length. If I put that in here, it'll unconditionally uh, display that. And so I could potentially have a variable that I use to sort of specify whether or not we are within an error case. Uh, there's also a, um, a hash that we can use that uh, is a special hash. I'm not going to get into it today. It works uh, sort of like the params hash, but it has a bit of a memory, a stateful memory associated around it, and we can put errors into it, and we could then actually stash a whole error message in it from the action and have that displayed on error. I won't actually go forth and implement that today because I think we've done enough work with our project for the day. And so I think that's where I'll stop things. We can now check to see if this screencast actually recorded. And uh, before I stop talking, does anyone have any last minute questions about what was developed today? Perfect. Let's see if this worked.